Right, it's about uh, 2.01. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining our State of the Health IT Industry 2020 webinar. Uh, I'd also, on behalf of Medicom Systems, like to thank HIS Talk for their support, co-promoting with us today. Uh, I'll be your moderator, James Ida. I'm the Director of North American Business Development and Corporate Strategy at Metacomp, and I'll be starting us off today. So first off, uh, why are we doing this webinar? Why, is it, well, why do we believe that it's important? Uh, we are coming up to HIMSS in just a few weeks, and towards the beginning of each year, we tend to see a lot of buzz around technologies and trends that I'm sure you'll see at HIMSS. Uh, for example, uh, ambient AI seems to be very popular this year. In previous years, there's been a lot of excitement around blockchain. And while much of that technology is exciting and does have great potential for our industry, we tend to see the same challenges from year to year and ask ourselves you know, why these problems still are yet to be solved in a meaningful way. Um, specifically, I'm referring to things like interoperability, clinician burnout uh, from EHR use, et cetera. And we at Metacomp are in a bit of a unique position as an EHR agnostic technology vendor to look at these problems from a little bit more of a systemic perspective. Uh, because we are a tech vendor, uh, we tend to look at things at least five years out. We try to stay quite a bit ahead of our customers uh, be, because uh, for those EHR and HIS vendors, sometimes it can take up to a year or longer to embed new technologies. Uh, so we really need to look and try to solve some of these problems on behalf of those EHR and HIS vendors, as well as, as, well as other stakeholders um, from that systemic perspective. And we want to share a little bit of that perspective with you here today. Uh, so today we're going to start with a brief industry overview um, about where we are and how did we get here. We'll talk a little bit about the current tech buzz uh, and then get into those challenges that we're still facing and why and go into a little bit about what those requirements are to solve those challenges at a more systemic level. Uh, and we'd like to share some examples, real world examples of what those solutions could look like in the real world in just about any EHR system. So you guys have something to take away with. We'll, give, we'll summarize that with some other takeaways and we should have time for some QA towards the end. By the way, we are recording this webinar. Uh, so everyone except for the panelists are muted for the time being. Uh, the slides and the recording will be available by email afterwards. We'll show that email towards the end. Uh, in the meantime, for QA, uh, please do submit your questions through the WebEx QA interface at any time during the presentation, and we will address those questions uh, once the main presentation is over. This is just the beginning of a conversation that we hope that you can share your thoughts and questions with us uh, and have the opportunity to see some of this and interact with it in person at HIMSS where we will be exhibiting. We'll be joined by two partners uh, who will be showing our tech integrated with theirs. Intelligent, the first one, they are a clinical NLP vendor. Dave Leroux, uh, our, our chief executive officer, will be talking a little bit more about them during the course of the presentation, as well as Holy Name Health. Uh, they have developed a cutting edge HIS using some of what we're showing here today. Both of those organizations, in addition to us, would be happy to go much more into detail than what we'll be able to cover today, but please come by us at booth 3559 if you are at HIMSS uh, so we continue that conversation. That brings us to our two speakers for today, the first of which is Medicom's Chief Executive Officer, David Leroux, who will be joined by Dr. Jay Anders, Medicom's Chief Medical Officer, both of whom will be at HIMSS to meet and discuss all of this further. With that, I'm going to turn things over to David to start us off. And there you go. Thank you, James. And I would like to add my thanks, everybody, for taking the time uh, to meet with us today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, where we are now, how we got there, and some uh, practical approaches to uh, doing it. James, if you could give me the next slide. Uh, 
as you can see by the, uh, we are in the post EHR world. Everybody talks about that. And what does that mean? That means that since the American uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act 2009 distributed about $35 billion to uh, encourage EHR adoption. As you can see by the graph on the left, it worked. Uh, about no, over 90% now have it. And uh, correspondingly, uh, it has put such a cognitive load and a disconnect with what the clinical thought process, et cetera, that clinicians are, you know, the big term now is clinician burnout. Uh, so uh, they've been adopted. There were actually mi minimal requirements to qualify to get the meaningful use money. There were no requirements for data sharing and interoperability. Clinical usability was not even a factor. There are many different code sets and terminologies involved, but no need to interrupt with them. Uh, you're seeing lately in the news, even though there were minimal requirements for data, the Department of Justice is coming down with actions oh, about every three months on a major uh, multi-million dollar judgment against somebody for a faking compliance with the requirements to get the money. All that sounds bad, but there are some positive aspects to it. At least it requires a coded problem list, a medication list, and some data, and there are good terminologies for that, Rx norm, SOM CT, ICD-10, et cetera. So that's out there, and uh, you can usually, in any of these EHRs, find a problem, find the meds most of the time. Uh, but then the question is, what do you do about it? What do you do with it? So one major issue is still clinical usability. Uh, we've been at this for about 42 years, trying to focus on clinical usability. There's about 100,000 uh, physicians using our stuff at the point of care in, in various products. So uh, we, get, we get flooded with information about what, what clinicians would like to see, et cetera, how there's been very little innovation from EHR vendors as they tried to meet all these requirements, et cetera. As James said, we try to look out about five or 10 years, and it's obvious to us that clean, usable clinical data is going to be the key moving forward for usability and physician satisfaction. James, if you'll advance it. So let's talk about usability and physician satisfaction and you know, what are some of the factors. Uh, I don't need to recite these statistics. You can find it everywhere, but uh, basically there's siloed data and information, inefficient workflows, providers can't find what they need when they need it, the, there's cognitive overload, there's this, what people call this data tsunami, and there's too much disparate information. More information, more stuff to deal with is not going to make it better. It's going to put more demands on the providers. They have less time to do it. There's scattered, scattered information. So there's a need to address this issue of usability and satisfaction. There's a need to put the information that's needed in front of the provider when it's needed so that they have what we kind of think of internally here as cognitive clinical clarity. They know what they need. They go to the EHR, and there it is without searching for it so that they can see all the relevant information for a condition or problem instantly. And now, on to value-based payment, the next slide. Now, you can see by both of these, Medicare Advantage, which is an outcomes-based, value-based payment model, is growing. So 20 million patients involved in it, ACOs have grown, this is putting a growing demand on providers and a growing demand for clinical data. There are about 10,000 ICD-10 CM codes that qualify for the hierarchical condition code treatment and risk adjustment in the Medicare Advantage problems. The issue is how do you identify those at the point of care or in a pre-visit planning thing? And if you think that the DOJ's actions about this were draconian with meaningful use with the $40 billion estimated by Medicare in overpayments for Medicare Advantage over the last three or four years, they want to know 
that the requirement to get reimbursement for Medicare Advantage, you know, these chronic conditions, and there are about 90 categories of these, they want to see management, evaluation, assessment, and treatment in your face-to-face -face patient encounter. On top of that, there are the star ratings, there are the e-clinical quality measures, all of these requirements are expanding. They're getting more complex. As you can see by this graph, the number of patients that are affected are going up. As you can see by the, uh, the previous graph, that satisfaction is going down. Systems must start to accommodate these requirements in real time when it's needed without additional data silos, without additional places to go, without additional frustration. Now, there's a lot. We move on to the next slide. There's a lot of buzz about how this is all going to come together and be solved. James mentioned uh, artificial intelligence, ambient AI, NLP. Uh, every year or two, there's some new buzz going into HIMSS. Free EHRs were one. Everybody knows what happened with practice fusion recently. Sam's Club was going to sell EHRs about 15 years ago. Patient engagement, Microsoft Health Vault, Watson, Google DeepMind. You will see on the show floor at him people showing that you can hang microphones in a room, record the conversation between the provider and the patient, turn that into text, turn that into data, and voila, it's magic. Everything's happy. Now, eventually that will happen, but in the meantime, it has to be linked in to workflows. These are not bad ideas, but there's really no silver bullet. As care is still delivered one patient at a time. Analytics can identify problem trends, patient cohorts, but they can't really treat individuals. Someone needs to take care of the patient. And for now, for now, we think that's still humans. Current buzz about AI, machine learning, et cetera, for data analytics, may work for data analytics for population health, et cetera. Uh, we have reservations about it working in real time at the point of care anytime in the next few years. But new technologies are rapidly evolving and will help. But they need to support clinicians now. So how do we get ready for those? How do we support current users? With more information, how do we provide clarity when the clinician is in front of the patient? And the key is good clinical data, actionable at the point of need, which will cover in the future not only face-to-face -face patient encounters, as the Medicare Advantage uh, program is focused on now, but telehealth and virtual health. But there are some challenges. If we could go on to the next slide, James. This sounds crazy, but we think to have computable clinical data, you've got to have data. There are many requirements. There are disparate data sets. There are all kinds of code sets and terminologies, some terminology maintenance tools, which do a good job of managing the terminologies for an EHR or a large enterprise, support well more than 100 different terminologies. How do you bring these together? These were designed for analytics. They were designed for coding. They were designed for classification. Many of them weren't designed for point of care use, but the reporting requirements say, You've got to treat patients and report out what you did using these terminologies. So how do you bring all that together at the point of care so clinicians can see what they need when they need it without worrying about all the plumbing underneath it? And that includes supporting regular clinical thought, you know, the classic documentation, soap type notes, new quality measure requirements, new HCC requirements within usable workflows at different points during the patient journey through care. So what do we need to do to fix it, James? We'll move on to the next slide. One of the approaches over the last you know, 10 years in population health has been, let's pour a bunch of stuff in a database, and then after the fact, let's run analytics on it, deliver reports on how we're doing, maybe, maybe hours, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe months after the patient's left. This gives you insights into what you need to do, but it doesn't actually do anything about doing it at the point of care. But there's hope. 
we talk about AI, we talk about buzz, et cetera, but those can support clinical decisions. Artificial intelligence can support documentation, compliance with requirements. At this point, that information needs to be usable both by clinicians and by machines. So the aim here is clinically integrated content with one aim, better care due to better data, accommodating natural workflows, and putting things in front of the provider when they need it instantly. So if we have all this data, who owns it? Uh, James, if you can move on to the data wars. Okay. Uh, anyone using data needs, it, needs to be able to find what's relevant, and that depends on who's looking for it. Um, I think uh, the current data wars, uh, everybody's watched the, you know, back and forth between EPIC and ONC over the last week or so, and uh, we believe that eventually, eventually all this data will need to work together. We're agnostic on, on who owns it. Uh, we're agnostic on how it gets uh, here and there, protected, et cetera, but we do want to make certain that whoever owns it, when it becomes available, it's usable by clinicians to treat patients. Now, there are some practical requirements for this, James. We're going to focus today on information sources that uh, we've been dealing with for a number of years. Uh, clinical notes, uh, coded data, uh, some systems, many systems already have uh, coded problem lists, coded medications. Uh, some some places have coded lab results, although a lot of times the labs are local codes. Uh, so there, is, there are some information sources available, but if you're going to use this and you're going to support all the new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that kind of buzz, you need to have clinical artificial intelligence that takes that data and is linked to quality care initiatives, uh, and we're, what we're going to do today is we're going to show that um, how, to, how to take that, how to link it together. Uh, we're not the only ones doing this. Other people are doing it. We think uh, the use of these kinds of tools will expand over the next two to three years, and we are going to present a couple of examples, I think three of how text and data and NLP and clinical AI can be linked together to not only produce good clinical data, but support clinical workflows when they're needed. So, and then once the data is better, machine learning will be much more powerful than it is, than it is now uh, when it's working on things that were designed as data points and not just designed as separate terminologies, code sets, et cetera. So, James, if you'll move on for the first thing we're going to show, and uh, we're not showing an application here, we're showing some capabilities. Um, there are people on this call who have similar capabilities probably. Uh, we're showing, we're gonna show one example of taking narrative text, converting it to computable data, and then linking that data to uh, a specific workflow that is required, and that is uh, quality metrics. Uh, this is just going to be a, a generic type look. Uh, we're not doing a demo. Uh, we, you'll be able to see some of this at HIMSS in, in our booth and in other exhibit booths. They have something similar. So this is a sample kind of look at it. We're just showing some capabilities here uh, to show you things that we think every system will have to deal with in the near future. So let's take a look. James? Okay, so you're, look, you're looking at just a, a very simplified presentation. I'm trying to get UIs and technologies out of the way. Kind of looks like a generic note format, so with a couple of sections. Um, let's, uh, new patient, you can see on the right, I'm, I'm gonna show two things here. I'm gonna show uh, some NLP going to data, link to workflows for quality measures before I turn it over to Jay Anders to pick it up from there. So. Uh, James, if you'll advance it. So I've got, you know, HPI, we, we don't care if this is 
dictated, uh, typed, speech recognition, it's text. 80% of most clinical notes are still text, so uh, it's unstructured data. How do you get data out of, how do you get computable clinical data out of unstructured data and then tie it to specific required workflows? So we have been working with a company called Intelligent who does a very specific and we think very interesting method of what they call medical or clinical NLP. So if you'll advance it, James. So we call this tagging text. And we're going to tag it to specific data points in a clinical relevancy engine. That clinical relevancy engine running in the background has two or three aspects to it. The ones we're going to show you today are the quality measure evaluation service. Jay will show you a clinically intelligent filtering service. And then he will also show you something uh, with uh, hierarchical condition codes and risk adjustments for uh, programs like Medicare Advantage. So let's tag that text and keep your eye as James goes to the next slide on the quality measures on the right. So you can see that the HPI the patient comes in for follow up with rheumatoid arthritis, COPD, former smoker, treated for coronary artery disease, beta blockers, he was disoriented, fell, dizzy spell, failure for stroke, it was negative, AFib. Uh, his father has a history of lung cancer, his brother with depression, congestive heart failure. And the reason we were really impressed with uh, the clinical NLP of Intelligent is it identifies the uh, person uh, who, on, on whom, to whom the data belongs. So you'll see under you know, past medical history, fall, personal history, previous history of smoking, family history, you'll see lung cancer uh, for the father, fraternal history, then review of systems. Then assessment, and you'll see down toward the two-thirds, three-quarters of the way down the screen, a negative for stroke, et cetera, it's on beta blockers. But the important thing here is it, it found those items, which are data points in an engine, and those items in the engine are tied to a different service on the right, quality measures, and it's now identified nine quality measures that are applicable for this patient given the data points that found in the text. The atrial fibrillation and flutter, COPD, et cetera. Now, we're not going to show it here today. This is not a demo. This is just a presentation of where we think the industry is going. Each one of those items on the right there has to have its own workflow so that those can be addressed either in pre-visit planning or at the point of care rather than, uh, rather than retrospectively, although this could also work retrospectively with code reviewers. Now, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Jay Anders, our Chief Medical Officer, who's going to show you a couple additional uses of good clinical data at the point of care to support specific workflows. So, Jay and James, if you'll take it over. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, and I'd like to add my welcome to everyone who gave us a little bit of your time this afternoon. Um, if we'll advance to the next slide. One of the things I'm going to talk about is today, EMRs have no shortage of data. They are loaded with it. But kind of how did we get to this particular point? So next slide, James. This is a photograph of my office in 2000. And believe it or not, that office is fully interoperable. It was called a fax machine. You call my office. I go find your chart in a mass of all of everything else. I copy whatever you want me to copy, and I fax it to you. So that's kind of where it was back at the turn of the new century. So now we've converted it to, next slide, James, electronic type presentations. That data that you saw in the charts is now all in these systems, and it's scattered usually everywhere. So there are medication lists, there are diagnosis lists, they are all separate from one another. There's no clinical links to them. It's just a lot of information that you still have to search for within an electronic format. So one of the things that I, we have worked on for a while at Medicop is how do we make information usable at the point of care? So James, if you'll advance uh, to the next slide. 
So as I said before, these systems are loaded with coded data. Here's an example of a very simple patient summary that has all of the incoming codes for all of the diagnoses that this particular patient has. Now I'm an internist by training, so I saw people like this all the time. So all that information's in there and I have to go searching for it. So it, what we do now with fire interfaces and CDAs and other things is we transmit all that coded data into another system, then we have to find it again. So if you'll go to the next slide, James. We have a clinical AI, clinical relevancy engine built within the system, and it takes that particular data information and makes it clinically relevant at the point of care. Now, what do I mean by that? So I've got a multi-problem patient in front of me, but I'm, today I'm, their diabetes is out of control, or I think it's out of control, and I want to look at just that particular aspect of their care. That clinical relevancy engine goes out and throughout that mass of data, because now it's been cleaned and polished and put together, it presents me with all the things that are related just to the diabetes. So now I can focus on that as a clinician and it takes away all the other clinical noise out of the chart. I can always go back and look at it all at one time if I want to, but if I want to focus on their diabetes, I'm going to be interested in a very few data sets about that particular progression of that disease. So hemoglobin A1C and plasma glucose, what medicines are they taking? Are they current on those medications? What are the lab tests related to that? So what we've done, once we've collected that really good, clean clinical data by using clinical AI, we can start to filter that data down to a specific disease stripe or even search the data for suspected diseases and present that to the clinician at the point of care. That's one of the great uses once you finally have good, clean clinical data is now you can provide that AI assist to the clinician at the point of care and let them work with the patient. Because I can't stress what Dave said enough. Patients are treated one patient at a time and the health of a population is advanced one patient at a time. So next slide, James. So now we're looking at chronic renal failure. Same type of of look at the clinical data. Now I can focus just on that and all of the associated meds and labs and orders and history and physical exam that go along with that. Easily switching from one condition to another to another and then bringing it all together at the end of a clinical encounter to make that whole clinical picture for that patient for that visit. So. We're interoperable, but we need to be able to sort the data because what happens today is we get a lot of data coming in, but we still have to make it usable. So just exchanging data is not going to be enough. We need to be able to apply clinical intelligence to that data to give the clinicians what they need and not mislead them down a path that they don't want to go. So next slide. As Dave talked about the Medicare Advantage program and these value-based payment systems, they've been around for quite a while now. Um, it you know, started out as HMOs way back in the day, but now Medicare Advantage and ACOs are starting to pay for performance, not that you're dotting I's and crossing T's and make sure you have the right codes or you have the right data elements in a note, but what did you actually do with the patient to make them better? And if you want to describe Medicare Advantage as a program, yes, it is a payment scheme, schema, that physicians and enterprises are reimbursed for the care, but it's really a chronic disease management program where they have taken very large dollar, very harmful chronic diseases and tried to incent physicians to manage those diseases. So next slide, James. So I'm going to take that same bit of text that Dave talked about. I'm going to apply the same NLP engine that Intelligent uh, is working with us on to use it in a different way. So in the Medicare Advantage program, the way you are reimbursed is risk adjustment factors, RAF scores. RAF scores are based on your age, what your Medicare Medicaid, uh, what diseases you have, 
how diseases interact together. It's a very complex algorithm to come up with that score. So I'm going to go ahead, if you look at this right now, this blended risk score for this particular patient, because we've not done anything to this person yet, or for this person, is the risk score is 0.339. So that's based just on the age, demographics, basic data. So let's go ahead and tag that text again. So next slide, James. So we're going to tag it. Next slide. So now that data that now we pulled out of that piece of free text is available to start doing something with. And what I mean by that is it's identified three different conditions that was pulled out of that history of present illness that are all HCC diagnoses. They're one of that 10,000 plus ICD-10 codes that apply to this particular patient. And this is all done real time at the point of care and presented to the clinician for action. So as you look at the screen, the risk score now has changed. And as the risk score goes up, the reimbursement for that patient goes up, obviously, because now you're being required to address all of these three conditions. So calculating an HCC and a RAF score is part of this. But as Dave talked about Medicare and their audit program, and I've been involved with some audits of Medicare, and it really is a draconian thing when they come into your office looking for things. So you have to be able to document all of these diseases for the, what they call the MEET protocol, manage, evaluate, assess, and treat. They have to be currently on a face-to-face -face encounter, and if at the end of the year you haven't addressed those, you will not be paid for those the next year. So it's in the best interest of the enterprise and the physician to do a good job identifying the diseases as well as documenting those diseases. So what does this data give us? Because it's data, because it's clean, we've applied clinical intelligence to it, now we can start to use it. So if you go to the next slide, so not only can I look at this particular patient's medical record and find the things I need, now I've identified all the HCC diagnoses within this particular patient's record and coupled it with all the applicable quality measures. So now, as a clinician at the point of care, I can start to address these. I may not want to do it all at the same time, but I have the ability to do so. And as Dave pointed out, being able to identify this kind of data also helps in a pre-visit planning meeting, and it helps in a post-visit review. But our goal is to try to give the clinicians everything they need at the point of care so the review afterward and the meeting of the pre-visit planning all is maximized at the point of care. So also within all of this, like I said, you have to do the documentation. So if you go to the next slide, within the same clinical relevancy engine I'm talking about, we have the ability to go out and pull the data elements that would be suggestions to document this particular problem. In this particular example, it's atrial fibrillation. So presenting to the clinician, what do you need to document to fully describe and meet the MEET protocol for this particular condition? Now we can go out and present that to the clinician at the point of care, and they can act on it. So plan tests, medications, imaging studies, all the things that are required. And if you look at this from a post-review standpoint, that record comes in, even if it's free text, we can identify all of the elements and be able to do a post-review much more quickly because now I know if I've meet, met certain aspects of this particular documentation, I've now met an audit proof meet protocol. So that's a couple of examples of just how once you get that really good clean clinical data and you can apply you know, clinical AI intelligence to it and present it to the clinicians, they can really start to act on it. And I think that's really gonna go a long way to enhance patient care, which is our first goal, and really enhance physician satisfaction, which is really our second goal. So I'm going to turn this back over to 
David, and we'll continue. James, if you can go on to the next slide. So unfortunately, we're all getting older. There's a whole lot of us getting older. And as, as we do that, there will be uh, additional pressure to get better outcomes and prove it. There's increasing shifting toward these value-based payment models, and the clinical quality measures are really an, effect, an attempt to enforce evidence-based guidelines at the point of care. We'll also be getting much more data in coming out of uh, machine learning, AI, we'll get personalized medicine, we'll get genetics, et cetera. All of these, to meet all of these, we'll have to get better data and we will have to get it into the workflows when and where it is needed to actually get better outcomes. So James, if you can go to the next slide. These are big challenges. We still have the challenges of linking all this together and finding the data, et cetera, that Jay talked about. We have all kinds of new te technologies coming to bear and they will help at the point of care, but they also might threaten to overwhelm the clinical user with this, what I termed earlier, cognitive overload. Uh, now, in addition to that, technology will probably advance faster than anybody anticipates in our industry over the next five or six years. But it's still going to be based on having very good clinical data, not more information, not more stuff in the chart, not more connectivity, but what do you do with it when you have a patient that you're trying to deal with and you've got all of this, all these requirements, all these workflows that have to be fit into an existing system? That's going to be one of the biggest challenges. These technologies will help. They'll help us focus on identifying what works and what doesn't, but we still have to deliver it one patient at a time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to James. All right, thank you. Um, all right, before we get to some questions, uh, if you have not yet submitted your questions, uh, please do so now through the WebEx interface. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our slides and recording will be available by email. You can see my email here. Um, I will be happy to, to share those with anyone who requests them. And please do uh, visit us at uh, the HIMSS show uh, in booth 3559, three, sorry, um, where you'll be able to see some of this yourself and interact with it um, in person. Our partners, Intelligent, will be showing uh, their NLP targeted at medicine, as Dave was showing earlier. Holy Name will be showing their cutting age HIS with some of what we showed as well. Uh, we'll also be doing some giveaways and we'll have a reception on both the first and second days of him starting at 4 p.m. So if you'd like to get some refreshments and play with some of this technology yourself, uh, we'll be doing that at Booth 3559. So with that, I think we can start opening things up for questions. Uh, uh, we've got... Um, for any questions so far, uh, we've got a couple questions coming in. So first, I'm going to open things right back up to Dave and Jay. Um, our first question is uh, for both of you, what effect will current controversy around data blocking have on interoperability? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that first, James. This is Dave. Uh, I think it's going to take some time to sort out. Uh, there will probably be an initial ruling on it. Uh, there will be challenges to it. Uh, the vendors who are not ready for it will be dragging their feet. There will be uh, valid concerns about uh, once they open it up, who gets the data and uh, what they do with it. Uh, part of that is uh, exacerbated by the recent news that Practice Fusion was altering clinical decision support stuff to prompt at the point of care to, for opioids outside of uh, the uh, suggested guidelines. So uh, there's going to be a war over the next year or two. Uh, I think that by the time we go into HIMSS 2021, uh, the dust will settle a little bit and these things will start to open up. 
one of the effects it's going to have is as enterprises see the spigot start being turned on for this, they're going to have to start to get normalized data. Tools like IMO has and health language and uh, other people to manage terminologies are going to have to be uh, are going to have to be used more aggressively to get standard codified data out of lab results, out of medications, out of problem lists, et cetera. So it will accelerate the move away from uh, custom catalogs with weird names for things to being more interoperable. Once people see that there's going to be a requirement to share this data, they will start to push to get normalized data out of it and that's good. We're happy about that because we're mapped to all those terminologies and then we can provide uh, clinically relevant filtering of it. Uh, but I think we still have at, at least a year to go before the dam breaks and people start realizing the government's serious about this. Jay? Well, the only comment I have about, um, about like who owns the data, for the longest time, it really is the patient who owns the data. It's their story. The enterprise may own the EMR that all that data is stored in, but as you've seen in the news, there are folks starting to share identified data, which I think is going to run afoul of a lot of folks and put people at risk of being discriminated against because that data is not being used in the way it should. So uh, as all this interoperability going forward, which I think is an absolutely fabulous thing, by the way, we need to have a full clinical picture of every patient that we see. But the issue is, did the patient actually get permission for that to be shared with me as a practicing physician or with someone else? And if we are sending gobs and oodles of this over to some data repository someplace without any constraints on it, there's going to be all kinds of issues. So to Dave's point, there's going to be a lot of shakeout going on as this spigot gets turned on. All right, our, our, uh, our second question uh, for the two of you is, um, how do you think that with the move towards home health and telehealth, uh, what effect do you think that's going to have on the EHR market uh, in terms both of, of usability but as well the payment system? Uh, I'll, I'll take that first. One of the things that we're already seeing when we talk to uh, home health providers, uh, hospice care, that kind of stuff, is that uh, there will be an accelerated uh, trend toward using what some people in the past have called physician extenders to provide care uh, to people personally under the supervision and assisted by clinical decision support, but under the supervision of nurse practitioners and physicians. We think that will accelerate. We think that you know, EHRs will have to accommodate that, put in uh, review and validation processes uh, against that, and, uh, and and also do the same thing in the telehealth um, thing. So I don't think that uh, you'll see more and more physicians running out to treat people at home or, or taking virtual visits, but you will see more and more uh, clinicians, not necessarily physicians, under the supervision of physicians and nurse practitioners providing that frontline contact. Jay? Well, I think the, the documentation is documentation, whether you see a patient on the phone or whether you see them sitting in front of you, um, or whether a home health giver is providing care in a home somewhere. It's going to put demands on how, that, how the systems are constructed because you're going to have to have some kind of cloud interconnectivity so data can flow in and out of these, these particular systems. But it, it comes down to meeting guidelines protocols, all those kinds of things, the documentation kind of is the same. So regardless of where you are, you're going to have to be able to not only bring in information, clinically filter get what you need, but you're also going to have to be able to act on it remotely and send it back. All right, we have another question about, um, you know, we hear a lot about the lack of usability as a, as a complaint. Um, how much of that, from your perspective, is really a lack of proper user training? Let me, Dave, let me take that one. Um, 
being a person who has run a very large multi-specialty group practice, about 120 clinicians, as well as being someone who's involved in the health IT field, there's a lot to be said about good user training, so you actually learn the system that you're on, but that's not the whole picture. When a system has multiple different steps, and we call it click counting, call it what you like, when it's designed like that, physicians inherently don't like to use it, or providers don't like to use it. There's a lot of places to go, and regardless of where you know and how to do things, it's still not well designed for the end user's workflow. So systems need to start to listen to clinicians, look at how they do their work, sit with them and figure out how they think, and that's some of the things we have done at Medicomp, and then start to put in front of them the solutions that they can actually use and use easily. So the user training starts to diminish. It's not as important because the system they're using is more intuitive at the beginning. I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> All right, there's, um, there's been a lot of movement lately around uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, so how, how do you all think that this will impact um, physicians, their satisfaction, and the longevity of certain specialties? Uh, Jay, me, you wanna take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Let's talk about the longevity of certain specialties. Um, you hear a lot about people getting a better radiology read on mammograms by a machine as opposed to a radiologist, a trained radiologist. Okay, that whole gain in readability was 1%. Now, is that a lot? It's, it, in medicine, every percent is important. I firmly believe that there is no replacement of a well-trained clinical person interacting with a patient and treating a patient and coming up with the answers that they need for their particular condition than a machine. One of the things as a clinician I have the advantage of doing when a patient's sitting in front of me, I have eyes and I have ears. I look at body language, I look at their skin color and all of those things. To compute all that inside a machine algorithm is going to be very, very difficult. On the flip side of that, do I think machine learning and AI can really assist a clinician? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we talked about today was a clinical AI engine that will augment what the clinician has to do. So AI has a definite place in all of this. Do I think it will replace specialties? No, I do not. Do I think that, think about all of the um, medical legal aspect of this for just a moment. If all of a sudden the machine makes a mistake and it's not been looked, like, looked at by a trained, licensed, insured clinician, what's gonna happen? Are you going to sue someone like the machine to figure out? So it's, there, there's a lot to be said but I do believe that as we get cleaner data, machine learning is going to be massively augmented and be more helpful. I think artificial intelligence will be helpful, but I don't think it's ever going to replace a physician. And, and I think it's going to be very helpful sooner in analytics, population health, identifying trends, uh, identifying uh, gaps in care over a population being treated by an enterprise and queuing things up for action. Uh, it's also going to get probably with machine learning, uh, the accuracy of NLP engines is probably going to increase significantly over the next three to five years. James, back to you. Yeah, we have uh, one last question about um, whether or not, we, we talked about clinical AI today and clinical decision support, and we have a question of whether or not um, what we've been showing here is covered under the um, medical device regulation or not. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, at, at this point, uh, most people doing these engines, including us, have been very careful that it does not suggest a single answer or make a diagnosis. 
as you saw when uh, Dr. Andrews was asking, he said, I want to see the information for diabetes. And what you'll notice on the screen, you probably didn't notice on the screen, that was set at a very focused list. The user can expand it. If, if what's on the screen and the, the result of an inquiry is a result of user action and not just automatically in a black box with a single answer, uh, the FDA so far is leaving it alone. Uh, Jay, you want to expand on that at all? Well, I agree with that. And the, the way that most of these systems are constructed is they are to be used by a trained clinical user. Uh, really emphasize trained clinical user because they're to augment their thought process, what they see, what they examine, what they think. So it's not replacing anyone, it's helping them go down a path and if they disagree with what's being presented, they have the full capabilities of expanding out of that. So I agree. All right, well, I think that is our last question. So um, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to end the recording here. Uh, feel, please feel free to uh, email us with any other questions. Otherwise, um, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and uh, we'll see you all at, at him.